is that okay? Yes, we do. Thanks. Um, okay, so good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the second Frax Friday. Uh, my name is Benjamin Chaplet. I'm a first engineer and I'm working as a European project officer at CNPF. And I'll be facilitating this uh, webinar uh, thanks to the help of um, Natasha Rovrik and uh, Mina Cornell from EFI and Mark Pryor from uh, Forest the Forestry Commission. Uh, I also must inform you that uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded. Uh, so as it will be um, available on the um, EFI YouTube channel and there will be a link in, uh, on the Forex uh, website as well. Uh, so as the topic uh, for this Forex Friday, we will discuss uh, three perspectives on national uh, carbon standards from France, the UK and Spain. Uh, Olivier Glaze from CNPF will talk about the label by carbon. Pat Snowden from Scottish Forestry will address the Woodland Carbon Code. Uh, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Marta Hernandez de la Cruz uh, from the Spanish Climate Change Office will uh, share about the Registro de la Huela de Carbono. Uh, please bear in mind that this is an interactive session and we would very much appreciate uh, your input and uh, comments. Uh, we are supposed to, to have um, uh, a little time left at the end of the presentation for a good discussion. Uh, since the audience uh, seems to be quite large uh, and we only have one hour, uh, I would suggest you to submit a, a written question or comment in the, um, in the chat box uh, here below on, on, on the side. Uh, so I will be able to, to share the, the question at, at the end. Uh, also, one simple rule I'm sure you're already used to. Uh, please turn off your microphone when you, you don't speak so we can hear the, the speakers. Uh, yes, so before I start, uh, yes, that was my second slide with the agenda that you already know. Uh, and I should mention at the end of uh, after this webinar, there will be a few minutes for the Mentimeter session that will be led by uh, Natasha Lovrick. So please stay tuned until the end. Uh, and now before, uh, before we start uh, the webinar, I'd like to, to give the, the word to Mark Pryor, uh, chairman of uh, Forex, who will present you briefly uh, the network and what it is for. Mark, you're ready? Great, Th thank you very much, Benjamin. And welcome everyone. And on behalf of the Forex Network, um, to the second of the Forex Fridays. Um, my name is Mark Pryor. I'm the um, Area Director for the Forestry Commission in the southwest of England. Um, but as member of the Forex Network, I represent the Forestry Commission and Forest Research. Um, so the Forest Network um, was officially launched in October um, 2019 after a couple of years of a lot of discussion about looking around what the actual real need and purpose of the network was. Um, perhaps you could pull up to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the membership, we've 14 members so far from around Europe, um, 11 different countries represented. Um, we run the network with um, six of the members as a secretariat. Um, with the European Forestry Institute, um, with Natasha and Mina uh, supporting us from an administration and a coordination point of view. Um, can you pass on to the next slide, please? We also have um, uh, about half a dozen observer organisations, and we're always very keen for new members to join. So if you are interested and you're not one of the member organisations, then please do, and or if you know someone who'd be interested, another organisation, then please contact um, uh, Natasha or Minna. Um, I mean, the main aims of the organisation are really supporting the members in their support of private forest owners um, in sustainable forest management. So it's around things like knowledge exchange, capacity building, uh, management planning and supply chain. So there's a whole wealth of information that we can share and support each other in building that capacity. Um, 
pass on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so we've one of the things we're trying to do, particularly in these virtual times, is these um, Forex Fridays. So the last Friday of each month, we're looking to set up these interactive webinars. Um, and so hopefully you'll join us in future ones. So we've got one on the 26th of March, um, which from our Finnish partners, um, and we'll hear more about that later. But um, anyway, um, that's enough from me. And let's get on to the meat of the of the, uh, of the day. Thank you. Um, that's enough from me. And Thank you, Mark. Uh, do you hear me still? Yes, we do. Yes, OK. All right. um, so now the webinar is being recorded. Um, I would like, before we start, I would like to say a few words to introduce the, um, the context of the subject of today, today's meeting. So as you all know already, uh, forest carbon sequestration is a key service that forests provide to society in order to tackle and mitigate the climate change. It is an, in, it is an ecosystem service, just like the protection against soil erosion, the protection of water resources, uh, landscapes and biodiversity. For this reason, foresters can carry out forestry work, sometimes costly, to promote carbon sequestration in their forests. For their part, uh, companies and communities carry out assessments of their greenhouse gas emissions. After reducing some of their emissions, which remains the only concrete solution against climate change, they may be interested in offsetting uh, even more their emissions and therefore may be willing to contribute to carbon sequestration in forests. Uh, having said that, the challenge is now to define a general framework allowing foresters and investors to contract with each other and guaranteeing the carbon sequestration in the long term, preventing so any greenwashing projects. We'll have now three pers perspectives on national carbon standards, which are the only standards uh, actually working in forests. Uh, so, uh, see, uh, I lost my, yeah, the shared screen. Uh, sorry. Yes. So for the first pre uh, presentation, pardon me for being rude, we won't start with our Spanish or nor British uh, guests, but with my French colleague Olivier Glaze from CNPF. So Olivier, if you can uh, get ready to share your screen as well, uh, while I will introduce the CNPF uh, briefly. CNPF is the National Center of Forest Ownership. It's a public organization with regional delegation and more than uh, 400 employees. With a wide range of uh, partners, uh, CNPF contributes to the development of uh, private forests uh, through advisory and coordination activities, training, and uh, knowledge dissemination. Uh, it is important to know that in France, uh, um, about 75% of the forest is privately owned, uh, which represents about uh, 2.5 million of hectares and 3.5 million of owners. Olivier Glaze. Olivier Glaze is a forest engineer and has been working uh, for six years now on uh, forest carbon mitigation at CNPF. Uh, from the beginning, he was uh, involved uh, with the partners in the conception of the label by carbon, and he, specially, he has uh, specially developed the, the three methods uh, that apply now to, to forestry. So now, uh, Olivier, you're ready to to present. Yes, thanks, Benjamin. We don't see your screen in, in full screen. You, you can put it. Is it OK? Yeah. OK. Thanks, Benjamin. So we will begin with the, the most recent standard because the label by carbon was launched uh, at the end of 2018. Um, so first of all, um, a word to say that the label by carbon uh, doesn't not apply to mandatory offsetting 
to the European Union emission trading scheme uh, because the label by carbon is the French standard for voluntary CO2 emissions of setting. Uh, the goal of the standard consists in rewarding projects which are positive to mitigate climate change. And for each project, it's necessary to quantify the carbon sequestration. So how does it work? The, the state uh, defines the standard. Uh, then, if you have a, a project, uh, it has to refer to a registered methodology. And we will see later um, that in the forest sector, uh, there are three methodologies. The methodologies are registered by the French Ministry of Environment. The ministry will investigate the project and afford it the certification for a defined duration. And uh, eventually, an auditor will monitor the, the project in order to the label by carbon can generate uh, the, the credits. Um, so who can offset within the label by carbon? Everybody. It can be a private firm, um, an administration, a public body, a citizen everybody can offset their uh, CO2 emissions with the label by carbon. So, as I said, there are three methodologies which are all redacted by the CNPF. Uh, first of all, the a methodology for a forestation project uh, with two baselines, the, the agricultural land uh, whatever the land, the grassland, the cropland, the orchard, the vineyards, or abandoned overrun lands which are in the process of natural colonization. Uh, the second methodology uh, applies to destroyed or impacted forests uh, with three uh, baseline, uh, forest destroyed by storms, by forest fires, or intensive diebacks. And a uh, third methodology for the conversion of copies to ice stands. So um, I won't detail the, the criteria of uh, a standard because uh, we have the same criteria in other methodologies, in other standards. But uh, a few words uh, of presentation. The main criteria uh, in a standard of, uh, of setting is the uh, additionality. Uh, it's very important that the project has to demonstrate that uh, without the carbon encouragement, the project wouldn't have been achieved. Uh, then a methodology uh, gives uh, the keys to quantify the CO2. Uh, the methodology um, uh, allows the verification of a project by an independent third party in order to generate carbon credits. Uh, the methodology deals with the, the, the risk of non-permanence of uh, the CO2. Uh, what if uh, there is um, a storm, a fire, a dieback? And eventually, um, we can valorize the social and environmental co-benefits uh, in the label by carbon, uh, and we will see an example uh, later. So, uh, what are the main characteristics of uh, the, the three methodologies? Um, the duration. The duration is uh, 30 years. And uh, there is a specific point, is uh, the, the generation of carbon credits, uh, because they are all ex ante. That means that even if we do the calculation, the quantification of the carbon under 30 years, the credit carbon will be emitted at the year five, 
for instance, or the year zero. It's uh, ex ante credit. Uh, and in uh, quickly in the, the methodologies, we will take into account the different risks. For instance, if you have a storm risk, um, the, we will apply a, a carbon discount to the total carbon uh, calculation. So it, uh, it's like a buffer. Some examples of um, projects which are all uh, certified by the label by carbon. Um, the first methodologies, uh, we have uh, here an example of an uh, owner who decided not to continue uh, the, the culture on his land and he decided to forest uh, a crop plant with a uh, larch. Another example, uh, we have here uh, an, ab uh, an abandoned land and uh, th this type of project can be eligible to the label back carbon. Uh, third example with a project of X and um, a grassland with uh, poplar. A very important uh, point is the rigorous quantification of additional carbon in these projects. Uh, for each project, we will take into account the difference of storage at the year of 30 and we will take into account also uh, the long-term average difference. And we will uh, take the, the smallest value. The second methodology for forests which are impacted or uh, destroyed, um, we have an example of a destroyed forest by a storm. Uh, it's a, an eligible project. Uh, also, we can see uh, on this picture a dead chestnut coppice, and we can uh, reforest with a more adequate uh, species. Another example with uh, in the Mediterranean region, uh, destroyed by fire. And I guess it's uh, something you you know because we can. We have the, the same um, examples in uh, other countries in Europe with the intensive diebacks by a bark beetle on spruce. Uh, in France, uh, it's uh, uh, very important in the northeast of uh, France. Uh, and a um, last example with the pathogenic mushroom, uh, Calara fraisia, on uh, ash. And the third methodology is a conversion of copies to high stands. Uh, so it consists um, in doing a strong thinning uh, in copies. We see a copies of chestnut with several stems from the same stump. And we will do at the early age uh, a very strong um, Thing. The impact of the, this thinning is um, to have trees, chestnut, uh, which can grow in diameter. So we, we can produce parquet or framework sawings, uh, uh, which will constitute um, a, a calculation. So in wood products. As I said, the label by carbon uh, can uh, do a, a valorization of the co-benefits of the project. For instance, uh, if you have a local employment, a PFC certification, a soft soil preparation, uh, we will take into account the native species, the non-native species, uh, and the mix of species. And uh, eventually, the, the water co-benefit. For instance, uh, the, the preservation of a forest pond, which is very interesting for uh, biodiversity. 
Um, the CNPF is uh, now uh, redacting um, a fourth methodology uh, about the Mediterranean forest and uh, thanks to a uh, European program, uh, LIFE, uh, which is called LIFE Forest CO2 and uh, France Bois Forêt. Uh, we could uh, write a fourth methodology for the, the Mediterranean forest of Aleppo pines, Pinus alepensis. And the project is um, to finance uh, the first thinning in Aleppo pine forest in order to decrease the, the fire risk in the future. In, 20 or 30 years, um, but it's very important because it's a region uh, where there is a uh, few silviculture. So in order to answer the, the numerous demands, we created a database of projects uh, which could be certified by the label by carbon. And we supply those projects to the, the companies uh, which are willing uh, to offset voluntarily their carbon emissions. So we have some project of afforestation, of reforestation, of conversion of coppice, and uh, also silviculture of uh, Aleppo pine. Thanks for your attention. Yes, uh, thank you, Olivier. But I think uh, maybe uh, only it was on my screen, but uh, your presentation were um, blocked uh, on the chestnut slide. Uh, I don't know if it was a problem for, ah. for the other as well. But yeah, we we hear you well. Uh, thank you. And if you can stop uh, sharing your screen and maybe uh, put your camera on, if we can see you, <laughs> just to to see who we're speaking. Thank you. Nice to see you, Olivier. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, if you have any, any question, you can uh, write them down in the, the native species on the side, and we'll answer them uh, at the end of the, of the presentations. Uh, so now let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Pat Snowden uh, from Scottish Forestry. So Pat, uh, yeah, we see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Right. Um, so get ready to to, to present your uh, your slides. Uh, I say a few words about you. Uh, so Dr. Pat Snowden has worked in forestry and land use for over 25 years. He joined the Forestry Commission in 2002, adding its economic team and leading the Forestry Commission's uh, climate change work at uh, national level. He chairs the team which has developed the UK Woodland Carbon Code. In 2019, Pat transferred to Scottish Forestry, a new government agency set up at the Forestry Authority in Scotland. His team continues to deliver economic advice and management on the, of the Woodland Carbon Code on behalf of the Forestry Authorities in the UK. Uh, a key part of uh, Pat's work currently is to help uh, develop markets in forest ecosystem services, in particular, the further development of the Woodland Carbon Code uh, carbon market. So now, Pat, the floor is yours and you... Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Great. Um, thanks so much for that. So I, I will give you a relatively quick um, run through the Woodland and Carbon Code and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, I was asked just to say something very briefly about the UK sort of forestry authorities. It's quite a complicated picture these days because of devolution in the UK. Um, the Forestry Commission used to be a GB body, but it now just covers England. We have separate regulatory and policy bodies in um, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland has always been a bit separate. Um, and these, these bodies basically are responsible for protecting, expanding, promoting 
um, forestry um, and administering things like grant incentives um, for planting and management and also technical forestry advice. In England, DEFRA has the lead as well on forest policy. DEFRA is the in, in Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, so briefly, what is the Woodland Carbon Code? Um, there's a, it's very similar in many ways to the Label uh, Carbon, which was just described. Um, it's a UK wide carbon standard. Um, so the carbon, it's a voluntary market in the same way as the Label Carbon. Um, it only applies to woodland creation. So in that sense, we only have one methodology at the moment, although we are looking at um, expanding that in different ways. And its purpose really is to provide trust in the market. Um, in the early days of carbon offsetting, say 15 to 20 years ago, there were some poor quality projects. It undermined investor trust in the use of woodlands for offsets. And that's really why the code was, um, was created. Um, broadly speaking, buyers of carbon credits, they have the carbon rights, not necessarily the timber or land rights. Um, in some cases, people will purchase the land as well. Key thing about the code is it, you know, it, there are various requirements, which I'll briefly run through. It needs to be backed by robust science, a transparent registry of the carbon credits, and independent validation and verification. And all these things are intended to build trust. The requirements very briefly are that um, all projects should cover uh, should um, adhere to the UK forestry standard, which is the government's guidelines on how to do sustainable forest forestry management in the UK. Um, additionality, as mentioned before, is a vital area too. We apply various tests here. Um, basically, we need to know that um, the reason that projects are going ahead is because of the carbon, in particular the carbon finance. So if it's legally required, it will fail the additionality tests um, and we apply various financial tests and also potentially a barrier test, which, but in practice, we haven't done that very much to date, but we're looking at that a bit further. And the issue there is whether the um, carbon enables some wider barrier to reforestation to be overcome. Permanent, second key thing, um, we're lucky to have good legislation in the UK, so forestry is a uh, wooden planting is a permanent change in land use under the Forestry Act. Um, there are various um, environmental impact regulations as well, which apply to forestry, which again, um, reinforce permanence. We also apply, um, we do risk assessments for each project, each project does them, and that should be on a separate uh, bullet here, but we apply a 20% buffer, um, whereby 20% of the estimated carbon credits are put into a shared buffer across all projects to protect against any future losses of verified credits in coming years and, and decades. Um, we are predicting and monitoring carbon sequestration is vital. Um, you need to set a baseline. We have to, you must take account of any leakage. And it's set up as a place to um, assess the uh, growth of trees over time for different species on different soil types under different management regimes and this will give you um, a projection of how much carbon sequestration you will get. Um, it's a conservative methodology, it's developed with our research arm, Forest Research. Um, in addition to the buffer by the way, we also take 20% off any carbon estimates as a measure of that conservativeness in case the models are, are inaccurate. Um, I'll say a bit more uh, in terms of carbon statements and reporting. Uh, we um, we allow projects to make statements about their carbon investments at the beginning of a project. So a company, for example, could say we have planted a woodland and it will sequester 10,000 tonnes of CO2 over its lifetime. Um, they're not allowed to report these credits at that point. They can only report um, verified credits to actually use against their um, carbon footprints to report in their greenhouse gas accounts if they have them. So it's uh, ex post um, crediting in that sense. Um, and the wider social and environmental benefits are important. It's a key reason why people go for our projects. And we have a tool developed which, um, which looks at these wider benefits, although it's optional um, to use. Um, about 
the robust science. Um, we have these carbon lookup tables based on forest research models. Um, and uh, we also use ESC, the ecological site classification tool, to assess each site as to what the yield class, for example, would be of different species on the site. And then there are protocols in place to assess growth uh, during the lifetime of projects, um, as you ver have to verify these projects at regular intervals to see how much they have grown and therefore how much carbon has been sequestered. Transparency um, is vital. Um, we run, well, the Wooden Carbon Code sorry, is on a carbon registry, which is run by Market, um, who are based in New York. They're one of the world's leading um, registry providers. And um, that is something that businesses insisted on in an early, at the very early stages that we put a registry in place, which um, provides clarity on the status of all credits. Every credit has a unique identifier and you can see whether it's who owns it, um, whether it has been used or retired or not. So it avoids issues like double counting. Um, the other thing to say is when you start out, um, you really all you have is a promise to deliver. So we call credits at the beginning of a project pending issuance units. And then as um, the trees grow and you start to verify the, pro the growth of the project, you can start to convert these pending issuance units into woodland carbon units, which are verified units, which as I said, companies can use um, to offset um, their emissions. Um, the costs are largely funded by government. We do take in some levies as well from each carbon credit, uh, which offset some of our costs. Um, independent validation, verification is vital. We have two bodies that do this, the Soil Association and Organic Farmers and Growers. And, and these are accredited by the UK government's accreditation service um, to do this. Um, in terms of reporting, all large companies in the UK are mandated to report their gross carbon emissions, um, and they have the option to report their net emissions. And they can use Woodland Carbon Code credits in those emissions, net emissions reports. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, ex ante statements of intent are permitted, but only um, ex post use of the credits is allowed. The development has taken quite a long time. Uh, we started working on the code in 2007 and it took us several years before we could launch it. It has developed significant, significantly since then. And we do keep adding things to it and trying to improve the standard. It's worth saying as well that a peatland code has also been launched. Um, we, we do work closely with them. They actually share the same registry as us now, um, but they are managed as separate standards. Um, there's almost 300 projects have been validated to date across the UK. Um, and uh, you can see that, you know, a lot of these, um, these, these, sorry, these will sequester up to about 15,000 hectares of woodland, we estimate. Um, and um, a number of these now have been also been verified at year five, which means that we're starting to get a flow of verified credits coming through. Um, and you can see a lot of companies have been involved um, in the Woodland Carbon Code to date. And that has grown a lot in the last couple of years. Um, there are some costs. Um, validation can be about £750 a project. It can be less if projects group together in our group scheme. Um, projects need to pay for each carbon unit that's listed on the registry. Um, and they also need to pay at verifications um, although a lesser amount for each unit that's converted to a verified credit. And you can see there some rough figures in terms of um, the potential income to projects um, again to offset those costs. It very much depends on the carbon price. I've said there that it's five to 15 pounds a tonne. That's probably generally been true. That There have been cases of 20 pounds a tonne more recently. Um, and uh, the carbon market, is, you know, there's a lot of commentary in the media that it's looking very buoyant in the coming years, so you would expect the carbon price to increase. In terms of our governance, um, we have an internal and an external um, board. The internal advisory board includes members of the forestry authorities that I listed at the beginning, and that board makes all the decisions. Uh, we have a wider advisory stakeholder board, which um, 
is also a vital part of running the code in, in practice. We consult them on every important decision and um, I can't really think of a case where we've done something that they haven't really agreed with. Um, so uh, th their advice and support is essential. Um, this governance may evolve over time, um, and but we're, we're taking that on a stage by stage approach. It's introduced us to new stakeholders in the carbon sector, also investors. Um, so it's grown our forestry world, you might want to, if you want to think about it in that sense. And there's a growing number of project developers who are coming into the marketplace to try and link land managers to investors and actually to get the whole market operating. And these market project developers and market intermediaries are, are essential. I don't think the market could have grown without them. Land managers can find buyers in different ways, but again, um, the registry does offer information about uh, credits that might be available. Um, but again, I think the intermediaries have a key role in, in linking up um, buyers and sellers in the market. Who buys? Well, that's quite um, varied. Um, there are two general motivations for companies wanting to buy these credits. Uh, one is corporate social responsibility, and the other one is to offset their emissions. I think over time, the offsetting has become a much more important objective than it was at the beginning, particularly as we see verified credits being released for sale now. Um, the, you can see that most people actually, most landowners have sold most of, the, of their credits up front. That 60% figure may have changed a bit now, but um, so landowners interestingly have the option when they start a project, they could try and sell all their pending issuance units and get a lump sum of income at the beginning, or they could decide to hold on to the credits and sell those credits either as PIUs at a later date or as verified units if they've been verified in the future and that will provide them with a, a future income stream but that choice is really up to them and you can see here some of the types of um, companies that have invested. There is an initiative in England called the Wooden Carbon Guarantee but I, I won't talk about that now there's not really time and then we have tools in place on it. Um, one example, um, this is the Yorkshire Dales Millennium Trust. You can see the wooden planting that's happened here. You can see that a proportion of the credits go to the buffer. And uh, you can see the lifetime of the project and, and also the companies to whom the, uh, the credits have been sold via Forest Carbon, who have probably been the leading um, intermediary in the market to date. Uh, this is Waitrose and it's, this shows some of their um, Motivations for being involved in the code, and you can see that it's a lot more than just the carbon. There's opportunities to involve staff in planting activities to highlight that what they're doing to their customers as well. In terms of the future, you know, we are thinking carefully about ways to stimulate the carbon market. Um, the net zero targets we have in the UK have, have done that a lot already. We've had a massive increase in demand in the last couple of years. Um, but there are wider market standards. Um, ISO are developing a standard on carbon neutrality. And these types of standards are really important because they provide signals to investors as to what is a good offset and what's not a good offset. Um, so we are involved in the development of these standards. And um, the, uh, as I say, they, they can really be important because companies are, are very aware of the reputational risks of putting their money into the wrong place. Uh, biodiversity net gain is a potential future incentive in the UK in particular. This relates to the need to um, for planning decisions to actually compensate for any biodiversity losses through investing elsewhere. Um, we have, you know, we're working on how that might interrelate with the Wilson Carbon Code in future, but it could provide a, an important income stream which could support future woodland planting and work alongside the Woodland Carbon Code. Uh, in general terms, we're looking to strengthen the carbon offset market in the UK, and that's a wider government objective. We want more integration with farming. Um, we have a lot of interest, people calling for agroforestry, for example, that, that's quite a topic just in itself. And then internationally, the Paris rulebook, when that's finally finalised, will be important in guiding the market. And, uh, and we do have support from ECROA, the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance, now that we are an accredited standard with them. So that ICRO is, is a very influential body in the business world in terms of um, what offsets are acceptable, for example. 
And that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Yeah, hi, sorry, I had a trouble with my computer. You can hear me now because now it's freezing. Yes. yes, you can. Yeah. Benjamin, we can hear you. to offset. Benjamin, we have lost you. We'll see if Benjamin comes and joins us in a second, but um, thank you very much, Pat. Um, and we'll move on to Marta now. Um, so Marta, are you there? Good. Can I? Can I ask you to introduce yourself and um, and start your presentation, please? Oh, do you call it? Oh. Sorry, uh, I don't know anymore if my presentation is on the screen or not. It was. It came. It went. It came and went. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. So now, should be there. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. So, good morning to everyone. Um. Well, afternoon in some parts of of Europe. Okay. We, we can't see the full present, full screen of the presentations. You know, I don't know. How can I? We can see it. OK, so, so sorry for the um, uh, I, I've been kicked out of, of the presentation. So <laughs> thank you, Martha, for. Yeah. But, uh, and you can see. It's just ah, OK, sorry. While you you try to to fix this, this program, I can introduce you, just to to present you. So, uh, Marta Hernandez de la Cruz is a forest engineer uh, from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. Uh, since 2010, she works in the Spanish Office of Climate Change of the Ministry for Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge. Her work focuses on mitigation of climate change in the so-called diffuse sectors. And uh, among other tasks, she coordinates the Carbon Footprint Registry. So thank you, Marta, for your presentation. <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. So uh, let's start. But before that, I would like to share something personal with you. Some 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 weeks ago, we were offered here at the ministry to 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 take part in a training about public presentations in English. But I have to. <laughs> I have to say I didn't find the time to 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 write the email and and join the the the, the course, so I regret it now. But I, I'll try to do my best. So as you said, I work for the Spanish Ministry for Ecological Transition in the Spanish Office for Climate Change, and coordinate the Spanish registry. And I've been there since the very beginning, so I'm glad to be here and uh, being able to share it with you. So what's uh, first, first of all, some main characteristics. So uh, as, as the other schemes we have seen is it works on a voluntary basis. There's nothing mandatory here. Uh, it's created by, by a piece of legislation, this royal decree you have here. It's been running now for six, uh, six almost seven years. Uh, and it, it only, so it, it does not only uh, look for um. And but we're the increase of carbon sequestration, but also has a part, an important part about uh, emission reductions. And I think that's the main difference with the other uh, schemes we have already seen. And uh, it, it tries to give an answer to that high demand uh, that has al already been mentioned of companies that want to offset with local some local uh, units. So in this case in Spain. So what's this with this registry with such a long name that we have is one registry with three sections and it works uh, uh, more or less like this. 
There's the first section is a carbon footprint and reduction plan section. It is very important that uh, it's not only about carbon footprints. It's uh, the main point is uh, you tell me how much you emit, but please tell me how you are planning to reduce these emissions. And this would be one section of the registry. On the other hand, we have uh, the sync projects uh, section, which is uh, the green part of the of the of the of the registry. And when there is a match, when one company that has uh, calculated its carbon footprint find uh, a nice project and 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 they get to a deal and and they exchange uh, CO2 absorptions it comes into place the third section, the offsetting section, so the accounting section of all these transactions, let, let us say. So I brought some information about the three uh, sections, but I think that to to maybe I can avoid giving you uh, more details about the carbon footprints uh, because maybe it's not that of that high interest in this in this in this case. Uh, but maybe the figures I brought is uh, as you can see. Uh, we have right now like 3,000, more than 3,000 carbon footprints in the registry coming from uh, 1,400 more or less organizations. This, mean they, this means they can uh, they can join one year after after year, which is all, also what we will like because it is not about telling, it's, it's, it's about seeing how you are evolving in your carbon footprint. And it, it's in, all around uh, Spain and all kind of sectors are, are involved in this. The SYNC projects, um, <clears throat> we are talking about SYNC projects in the agroforestry sector in general terms, so the royal decree doesn't tell us where to do um, or which methodologies or what type of, of methodologies uh, we have to, to use, so it's very open, but right now we only have uh, two, let us say, two methodologies, so here I say afforestation, but maybe it's with the term terminology is afforestation and reforestation, so it's uh, afforestation in, in those places where there's there has not been a forest for a long time. This is from uh, 1990. There has not been a forest there or after a, a wildfire. Um, we are talking about uh, a minimum surface of one hectare and a minimum permanence uh, commitment of 30 years. We are providing an ex-ante CO2 estimation. It, it is mandatory that they use these, these methodologies that we developed. And it is also mandatory that they have a management plan and also like in, in the other schemes, uh, we have a five year monitoring system. They have to keep telling us how things are, are, are going and they will, uh, um, then we will have this exposed exposed methodologies so to calculate how things are going on. So some figures about, about this section. We have right now 65 projects, uh, almost 1,000 hectares, and the projects are very different. They are from one hectare until, uh, but but we also have some projects about 100, 100 hectares. So they are very different. But at the beginning we had very little ones, and now we are we are seeing how they are increasing in in area. Uh, this means that they are going to absorb in in all the permanent period more than 2,000 uh, tons CO2. They are located, most of them, two thirds of them in public uh, land and the other part is on, in private land. And the methodology most used is that that means that they are in, in some kind of scrap land or agri, agro, agriculture land and they change to a forest. 13 of the projects uh, run already out of CO2. And as you can see in the in the graph, uh, so you don't see it very very well, but you can see the trend is this is the number of projects we have per year, and you can see it has so in last year has doubled the year before, and uh, so what we are seeing right now and that this is going to happen again because we already have a lot of projects in pipeline. Uh, regarding compensation, uh, so what we have here is an agreement between parts. We we don't intervene in in, in the price or in the agreement, so mm, we don't even have to know about it. Uh, so we don't know what's happening there, but they come uh, afterwards to us and they say so. Th there has been this exchange of of units, and we acknowledge this this 
offset of the car this is very important of the carbon footprint that has al already been registered so this is maybe it's a limitation re regarding the other schemes and we are talking about uh, um, offsetting with 20 percent of ex ante credits let us say so at the beginning they can only use 20 percent of ex ante estimated co2 absorptions and afterwards when they go farther they will be able to use uh, the rest with ex post credits and we also created a, a buffer there's a buffer that protects some some kind of, of, of events that could happen. Um, all, we already have had uh, more than 6,000 uh, offsets, so units, um, so tons of CO2 moving from, from the projects to the companies. Uh, and the range is also, again, very wide from one ton of CO2, which is very frequent, frequent because we are talking about SMEs normally, not big companies, but SMEs. And But we also had, so the extreme com compensation we had was this about 500 tons CO2. And you also can see the trend in the graph that, so interest is being increasing and, and they are now finding the way how, how to do these things. So uh, let's see, as this was more or less about uh, technical details and let's see what's going on out there and, and the project. So you can find the list on the on the web page. This is the list we have right now and a little report uh, about every every project. So I brought you two, two, two examples and the, uh, of what's going on on, on how the projects are de developing right now. This is a project of, uh, well, more or less in, in, in the middle of, of Spain, 35 hectares. You cannot see the trees in the in the photo, but it's a very nice photo of the of the hills there. And uh, well, they, they say minimum permanence uh, is about 40 years. So what happened, and, and the project has been going on uh, for a few years now. So what happened with this project? They already, the units were already used uh, uh, by 29 companies. And as you can see there, those are the names, but you can see some companies acquire like one ton CO2 of this project, but maybe for five years, one after the other, or some companies acquired 80 tons of CO2, but uh, well, it's been going on all these movements of sets here. But on the other hand, we have these, Let's see it on, on, on the other hand. This starts with a company that has calculated its carbon footprint. It's ha it has registered that and it has right now eight carbon footprints on the, on the registry. And uh, what has happened with this uh, company? It happened this. We have, uh, they have planted right now three uh, forests. These uh, three areas from the beginning, three hectares, four hectares, and the third one, six hectares. And uh, they, they found a place where to plant near the factory. And they are doing this there, and they took the, their employees there to plant, and the kids from the, the children from the school. But, and they already, they are using the units uh, they are creating to offset their own carbon footprint. So they are, these are the two, the two focuses or the, the two situations we have right now. So companies that are uh, doing their projects and they are selling to different uh, other companies. And on the other hand, we have some um, social, uh, social, um, how do you say, responsibility and, uh, of the of the companies and they are using it in, in this way. Both of them are, are very popular in the registry. And these are two examples, but there are many, many of them uh, on the registry. I also wanted to share with you what's going on. As, as the previous speaker said, uh, this is, uh, we are always evolving and we want to make uh, changes and we want to provide more carbon to the, to the, um, to the projects because, uh, so if we are realistic, the, the, well, the forest in Spain uh, ha can have a, the, the potential of sequestering uh, uh, an amount of, of, of CO2 and we would like to help, uh, for example, by introducing the, 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 um, the carbon in the soils. We all Good morning to everyone Thanks on the requirements and bring up uh, the environmental social in some parts of, of Europe, more formal way, so to give importance to all this. We are working on the next post 
calculation, which uh, calculator, which is uh, very important right now because we are at the point we have to provide this information to the developers of the projects. And we also would like to include some new projects uh, or topology of projects. So the easiest one, and I think that's not going to take a long time, is to introduce not, not only wildfires, but also natural disturbances. Mm, also a change of species. Sometimes when there, there are forests that are exotic species, we, we would like to, to provide an, the opportunity to have uh, projects of these. Forest management, why not? We also are in touch with this life project in the Mediterranean area that has been taking place here in Spain, so we could in include that and also wetlands. There's also a very, very interesting project here, life project also, that is developing an, a methodology for, for wetlands. And we also would like to, on the carbon footprint, which is relevant, I think we, we would like to in include the events carbon footprint because I think this will increase the demand of CO2 units, so that's also important. And before I finish, I also wanted to share this, these pictures with you because this is uh, also beautiful things going on in our projects. As you can see, well, the children just uh, getting to know how you where so how how you plant a tree and 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 sharing the experience of creating a forest from from the very beginning. And we also have some projects with a, an important part in the social social part. And that one there, uh, you can as you can see the, the workers, uh, they were they are local workers that received a training. So how to do this job and they were selected with the social service services of, of the villages they, they lived in, which are also very little villages uh, somewhere somewhere in Spain. So we don't have to forget uh, that this is also very important in our uh, scheme. And that was everything from my part, so happy to answer your questions whenever you you want. And I'm going to stop sharing the slide. Thank you, Marta. Um, uh, <laughs> I see th the time uh pass really fast uh we have only two minutes left if you want to to keep the, the schedule um so i'm really sorry that uh, it's so frustrating to to not be able to to have a, a good discussion uh, so in this case in spain discussion we 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 have uh and there's pretty uh numerous as well um so uh, there's a, a couple of questions. Uh, we, we won't be able to answer them uh, right now, but uh, with the speakers, they will <laughs> we will take some time to answer them, all of them, and uh, share the answers with you uh, by, by email uh, later on. Uh, but maybe we can take a few minutes uh, for each, uh, each speaker uh, to answer one question that has been asked uh, several times. It's about the price. How, how did you define the, the price of one ton of, of CO2? And uh, what does it cover? Uh, does it cover the field work, the plantation, uh, the engineering and project management? Uh, can, uh, can somebody try to, to answer this question? Maybe uh, first, uh, Olivier, can you say something? Yes all these transactions let, let. Um, the type of project um, on the species uh, if uh, it's a project of afforestation with uh, coniferous or broad leaves uh, we don't have the same quantity of uh, carbon uh, under 30 years uh, so the, the species and the type of project because if you start uh, with a, a cropland uh, it's different Seeing how you are evolving in your carbon forest management because you start from a forest so the quantity of carbon is uh, uh, smallest uh, than in the case of uh, an, an afforestation of a cropland okay thank you pat do you have a, an answer for that how did you define the, the price well the, the price is um in a sense it's it's nothing to do with us because it's negotiated on a project by project basis between the landowner and the purchaser, the buyer of the credits. 
So it will depend on the project. You know, in some cases, a landowner will say, well, it's only worth me doing it if, this if you pay me £10 a tonne, whereas somewhere else, a landowner may say, well, I'll do it. I can do it for seven or somewhere else. It may be 20. So um, we've not systematically recorded data on prices, but we have a good idea what happens. But um, the, the one the one complication to it is where you have um, some intermediaries um, actually buy the credits from the landowners and then sell them on to investors. So there the, the, there will be a difference between what the investor pays and what the landowner gets. But Okay, Marta, you are also. Uh... Yeah, for us it's the same case. So we don't. It's an, a private agreement be, between them. So we don't really know what's going on there. But it depends on. Yeah, it, it depends of the characteristic of the forest and then on how much amount they want to, how much uh, payback they want to have uh, in that moment of the whole investment they already have done. But it is. Yeah, we we really don't know. Okay. Um, okay, so th there has been this exchange. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, uh, for the introduction of Forex and uh, Natasha. The limitation re regarding. Um, uh, again, uh, there's plenty of, of, of other questions that we, we, we don't have time to, to answer them right now, but uh, for sure we will answer them, take time to answer them, and uh, we'll, share you the, we'll, we'll share with you the, the answers. Uh, so now I can uh, give the word to Natasha because we have a very short uh, session with the Menti matter. Like now we have some questions to you. Yes, <laughs> thank done. you very much for